Well, welcome everyone to Beyond the Crucible. I'm Gary Schneeberger, your co-host of the podcast and the communications director of Crucible Leadership. And you have clicked play, you have subscribed to, you have, uh, you have loaded, uploaded, uh, you are listening to a podcast that um, helps people live and lead with significance. That's the goal of Beyond the Crucible, to help you live and lead with significance. And uh, we do that through the prism of crucible experiences, those moments in life we all recognize them. We may not call them crucible experiences when we have gone through them, but we recognize them as painful failures and setbacks that can feel like the world has changed. The, the river, the course of the river of your life has been altered. The trajectory of where you're headed has, has shifted. They are painful experiences, but they're not the, the end of your story. They are, uh, in many cases, the beginning of your story. If you do what we encourage you to do on this podcast, which is to learn the lessons of those crucible experiences, to apply those lessons, to craft a vision, to make that vision a reality, and to live a life that's pointed to a life of significance. That's what we talk about here at Beyond the Crucible. And with us, as always, is the architect, the author of uh, Crucible Leadership and the host of Beyond the Crucible, Warwick Fairfax. Hey, Gary. Great to be here. Warwick, we've got an indispensable subject I think we're talking about today, um, and that is perseverance. And one of the things, before we really get into talking about how perseverance uh, works in our lives and how specifically it applies to leadership and crucible leadership is that that it seems that crucibles are the soil from which perseverance can grow in other words it's really hard to envision a circumstance where you can move beyond your crucible without having a measure of perseverance in your life is that a fair statement uh, yes, Gary, absolutely. Um, many of us will go through a crucible of one description or another. It could be a business failure, getting fired, health challenge, loss of a loved one. And um, it's not easy to come back from devastating setbacks. But without perseverance, it's really tough to come back. And we'll talk more about this uh, as our discussion continues. It's almost a choice to get out of bed or not. Do I, you know, this day get out of bed and say, okay, I'm in a direst of circumstances, the lowest of lows, but I'm going to keep going. It's that, you know, perseverance is really the key to bouncing back from a crucible experience and certainly the key to a fulfilling life or even to be a successful leader. I can't think of any leader that I can think of that um, succeeded in their field without perseverance. You could pick business, athletics, the arts. It's just tough. There's setback after setback, disappointment after disappointment. But that sense of perseverance is really is the key to life and leadership and the key to bouncing back from crucibles. And it is true that it's very hard to be a leader, to, to make your mark on society in whatever way that you choose to do it without having some measure of perseverance. I do, as I always do when we do one of these episodes where it's just the two of us talking about a principle of crucible leadership. I did a search for quotes about perseverance, like I do a search for quotes about character and a quotes about humility and about transparency. And it returned, that search on Google returned like 35,000 results. I mean, perseverance is a topic that people talk about and that people who have achieved some level of significance slash success have had to muster in their lives. That's why they talk about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. What um, uh, you said something when we were, were talking about how we were going to go through this episode yesterday, you said something I thought was just really um, poetic where you talked about the gift of a crucible and that the fruit of that in, in one of the fruits of the gift of a crucible is perseverance. 
explain what you meant by that. Yeah, I mean, crucibles are, are never fun, but out of the ashes of your crucible experience uh, can come a vision. It could be to help others that have, um, you know, if you've been through a terrible circumstances, whether it's bereavement, losing a, loss, a loved one or uh, abuse, what have you, you can have the sense for you want to help other people. And so, um, you know, out of the ashes of crucible experience can come a, a sense of perseverance, a sense of wanting to help others uh, to, ma to make a difference. Sometimes in our lowest moments, we find strength and courage and perseverance that we never knew we had. Um, mm -hmm. It's really is... Uh, somebody once said, one of our recent podcast guests, it's we learn the most during the low points rather than right. the high points. It's sort of the, it doesn't feel fun at the time. It feels agonizing, excruciating, but years down the track, it will never really say, gosh, I'm so glad I went through it. But there are things we learn about ourselves and about who we are and what our deepest desires and passions are about and and just how much character and uh, strength uh, and perseverance we have. So that can be the fruit of a crucible experience. And it can, that gift can truly be knowing that we can persevere, knowing that we can survive. You know, we talk about crucible experiences, difficult things that occur in life. One of those 33,000 quotes that I did pull is from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I just thought it was, it was uh, just extraordinarily phrased when he said this. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. At its core, especially in relation to leadership and crucible leadership, moving forward, keeping in motion, keeping pressing toward the vision and the goal. That's really what perseverance looks like in the universe that we're talking about here, isn't it? It is. I mean, that's a very good quote, and that is so true. I mean, part of it is it's getting up every morning. It's what am I going to do positively to move forward? <clears throat> if you're unemployed, okay, what, you know, what is it I can do to find a job? Where can I go? Are there places I can volunteer, employment agencies? Who do I know? Uh, you know, maybe if you've been through some bereavement or abuse, how can I turn this experience to help others? So it's really getting up in the morning and saying, okay, what positive step can I take today? I may not have the end vision or the total clarity about where this is going, but what's something positive I can do today? You know, to use an overworn sports analogy, what can I do to move the ball a few yards down the field? You know, the touchdown, uh, maybe so far away you can't even see it but you know don't get so focused on okay there's these millions of things i got to do how am i going to do it all it's like you know what one thing can i do today that's a positive step to move forward and really that's probably the key to perseverance as we were discussing earlier it's a choice it's mm -hmm. a choice to sort of move forward it can be a i mean there are several things that's a bigger topic but i think of forgiveness you can be sitting in bed saying, I'm not going to get out of bed today and do anything positive because I'm just going to sit and be angry at those people that kind of hurt me or did me in, or I'm going to be angry at myself. You know, if that's holding you back, which anger and resentment and lack of forgiveness can, it's like a millstone around our neck. It's like, okay, so I don't have to agree with things. I don't have to say what happened was right, but I'm, I'm going to put that aside. And I'm going to move forward because it's not, if it's not serving me, time to toss those negative emotions away. Okay, what positive thing can I do today? So it's really a choice to say, okay, no matter what's happened in the past, how can I move forward? What one positive thing can I do today? I mean, that is the key because over days, weeks, months, and years, those series of positive things will, you know, uh, almost inevitably lead to a very positive direction if you keep doing that, or at least right. it's certainly better than the alternative. And it's, it, that's very uh, wise to point out that no matter what happened in the past, you have to move on, move forward, as, as that quote from Martin Luther King indicated. But there's also sometimes 
no matter what may happen in the future. Sometimes what can lead us to not want to get out of bed figuratively or literally is that we fear something that's coming up, fear something that's coming down the road. We fear where things might lead. Um, so it, it's interesting that perseverance can be tied to what has come before and what may be coming up ahead that might be fearful to us. So what would be your advice, Warwick? There are people listening right now and, and they're in a, at an emotional place where they don't know if they have perseverance. They don't know if they can um, muster perseverance. I know you said, get up, put one foot in front of the mm -hmm. other, but from an emotional perspective, how can listeners orient themselves to take that step, to put that left foot in front of the right foot and get moving? I think of two words, and that's hope and fear. Mm. Follow hope, not fear. I think of um, Margie Worrell, who we had on the uh, podcast uh, a, little, a little bit ago, and she is all about helping uh, women and men uh, be brave and toss away fear. And she uses this phrase, for the sake of what? And so, you know, we cannot let fear control us. It's often, you know, fear is an emotion sometimes can be helpful. You know, there's, uh, you know, primitive, primitive uh, men and women were out in the wilderness, a bear's coming. Okay, it's understandable to be fearful. Let's run. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Survival instinct. Yep. Yeah. So there's a reason for it, but don't let the fear of the unknown or what if I fail again? What if I'm humiliated again? What if, what if, what if? It's like, okay. That could happen, but you know, you've got to be willing to take a risk. That's the key part of perseverance is be willing to take a risk. And that's where, again, I love the phrase that Margie uses for the sake of what. And so it helps to have a vision. It may be, you know, maybe you're a cancer survivor, again, uh, an abuse survivor. Your notion may be, I want to help other people who are in my situation. That's for the sake of what. I know I'm fearful. I know I might be rejected, but this is too important. This is more than just me. I want to help other people. So it's that sense of hope. It's that sense of cause. It's, it's the vision. Maybe you've got a, a business that you have an idea of that you think will really help people. I mean, I'm a big believer with significance in for the sake of what being something that is more than just focused on yourself. Because to me, uh, to overcome fear and an inertia when it's for the sake of other people, that to me is a higher wattage uh, lamp or, you know, a, 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 it has greater strength to pull you out of a, a funk and out of a, you know, it's all hopeless. So fear is a natural part of being human, but I think it's, it's for the sense of hope, the sense of for the sake of what that says, okay, I know I'm fearful. I get that, but I, I choose not to let my fears define me. I will, you know, yes, I'll be willing to fail. Maybe I'll be mocked and rejected, but you know what? This is too important. It's not about me. It's about helping others. So that's probably the key to conquering fear, which is, you know, the biggest reason you just don't want to get out of bed. It's like, well, I've hurt so badly last time. I'm never going to emerge again because I don't want to get hurt. That's understandable, but you can't let fear control your life because that leads to um, despondency. And um, I think Maggie Warhol also uses a phrase from uh, Thoreau, which I love, which is we don't want to lead lives of quiet desperation. Mm. You don't want to be that man or that woman. You don't want to be that person. And the way to avoid living a life of quiet desperation is to one foot in front of the other, get out of bed, and um, you know, just what 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 is it you know that's going to motivate you to take that next step? How can helping people really you know, be part of that? So that's that's the key. It's hope hope over fear. And it sounds like as you describe that, and I hope listener, I hope you hear this listeners, it sounds like the fuel, the, the same fuel that fuels being able to be, to have perseverance, the same fuel of perseverance is the, is the fuel of significance. Those things, a vision, a vision will lead you to a life of significance. If you know what it is you want to accomplish to help others, that will drive you. But, a, but that same vision will lead you to perseverance and lead you to bounce off walls that want to block you and find ways around walls that want to, to uh, block you. Exactly. You have to have fuel. And the fuel is vision, significance. That's what helps you with, with perseverance. We'll talk you know, later about some 
examples from uh, history and my family, in fact, my own life. But that's pretty much the key is, is there's got to be something that's, you know, uh, that's motivating you. You know, maybe um, you're kind of destitute and your family is sort of in and out of halfway homes. For the sake of what could be, you know what, I want my family to have a roof over their heads and, and you know, food and, and their stomachs. And that's motivating. That's a powerful vision too. It's, it's for the sake of what it's, you know, what is your why uh, that's really can fuel you to be able to move forward. Okay. You've just jumped ahead in what I was going to do by saying that. It's so <laughs> fascinating. We did not talk about this. Listeners, we did not use the phrase, what is your why, prior to this recording. But I pulled for the end of this podcast, I'm mm -hmm. going to list three things that come from top business magazines about how you can find perseverance, how you can live in and pursue perseverance. And one of the things, so I'm going to give one of them away now, I'll give two more mm -hmm. at the end, but one of the, the, the three things I was going to talk about, Success Magazine pointed out that fuel for perseverance is to remember your why. What is your vision? That's, you know, so from a leadership perspective, a business perspective, that's what Success magazine in addition to you warwick say is extremely important we have two more coming toward the end you I mean, mentioned I, warwick I, oh, just, just on that ahead. just on that one real briefly um you know and especially in the world of crucible leadership you've gone through a crucible a devastating failure a personal setback um the why can be rooted in as i mentioned before the ashes of that crucible experience so whether it's you know, business failure, getting fired, uh, divorce, abuse, loss of a, a loved one. It can be, okay, how can I use my pain to help others? When you've gone through certain experiences, it gives you a uh, unique, unique empathy for others. So, um, you know, that's really the, uh, that, that, that's really the, uh, the, the key I find is, um, uh, often the why will come out of the ashes of the crucible. It doesn't have to, but it often does. Yeah. And that goes back, listener and work, that goes back to what I said at the top of the uh, episode, that word that you said about the gift of the crucible. The gift of the crucible is the why for what it is that you're going to pursue. Um, you mentioned, Warwick, that we're going to start talking about um, uh, some examples. And I'd like to... Um, have you, if you, if you would, start with a family example, your great-great-grandfather, John Fairfax, because I, I have here, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see it. I have here the book um, that um, you quote often on the life of John Fairfax. And after you sort of set up the story, Warwick, about um, how perseverance played such a big role in John Fairfax's founding of the media company that you were heir to. I want to read um, a couple of paragraphs from the book that really hammer home, that really elucidate the perseverance that he and his wife, Sarah, had. So share with listeners a little bit about your great-great-grandfather and his, uh, his, his truly, truly perseverant life. Yeah, so uh, John Fairfax came out from Australia in the, um, in the late... Uh, 1830s, he had uh, started a newspaper in uh, Lamington in, in England, and he was sued by a local lawyer twice. Uh, the judge ruled in John Fairfax's favor that the story was accurate, that it was not liable. But, but the court cost ended up bankrupting him, even though he was justified in the court. So he comes out to Australia with his young family with almost nothing, but um, that really didn't discourage him. He had this vision uh, of a paper that would, in this young colony of Australia, uh, and just a couple of uh, things that he said uh, to me is interesting. You know, th this dream kind of wouldn't die. Um, he was the local librarian in what's now the State Library of New South Wales. He and um, a guy, Charles Kemp, who would, would become the editor of the paper while John ran the business side, they would um, kind of sit long into the night and they had this vision of this newspaper, 
which would be the Sydney Morning Herald. They called it the plan because they wanted to buy it and, and run it collectively. And uh, this newspaper would be uh, without fear to express opinion, without the reproach of self-interest, sworn to no master and free from the narrow interest of sectarianism. It was a vision of how it would uh, serve people uh, without being beholden to um, one party or another. You know, he talked about doing their utmost for the improvement and growth of the, of the colony. Uh, John would handle the business side. His partner, Charles Kemp, would handle the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, journalistic side, and together they'd collaborate on the editorial. They would uh, fight for just causes and expose abuses. I mean, it was very idealistic, a very strong vision, and it, it carried them through. One other brief thing about almost within the same year that they uh, bought the paper in City Morning Herald in 1841, Australia went through a big recession and the company was on a knife edge. They had to rally the, their employees and say, look, we're going to have to cut wages back a bit. We're going to cut back what we receive as partners, but I promise you, you'll have a job and we'll do our best to pay you back. And it wasn't easy. But what got them through that first crisis after they bought the paper, it was their belief in the vision that this was too important. Mm -hmm. You know, they were going to do their level best to keep going. So the vision really enabled John to get over his past disappointment in England, the prior bankruptcy of his paper, the unjust treatment of that lawyer, and just ability to get through the 1841 recession. And it also, and I'm going to read from this book, the story of John Fairfax published in 1941. This was right the hundredth year of Fairfax media, the company that your great, great grandfather started. And his vision also led him over the fear of what it was like moving from England to Australia. And I want to read just a couple of paragraphs from this book because it's so compelling about where perseverance comes from and how to live it. The book says this, as they approached the coast, this is John and his wife, Sarah, John saw the stark, forbidding barrenness of the land. He felt a terrible despondency and a concern for Sarah and her sick baby and the fear he felt for the future weighed upon him. He stood alone on the spray swept deck with his arms folded, bracing himself against the lurch of the ship as she pounded onwards and looked out at the sterile, hope-shattering strip of coastline that was the southern border of his future homeland. He thought of the responsibility which was his of providing for a wife, a mother, and four children, and he thought of the 12 sovereigns, just 12 sovereigns which stood between them and starvation. He bowed his head, and fear like ice stole over his heart. Better surely to have remained poor in Leamington than to starve in that sandy, soulless wilderness. Then this happened. He felt a touch and a hand stole into his. It was Sarah. She looked pale and ill and she staggered in her weakness as the ship plunged and shook. And this is a quote that I've seen you use before, Warwick, but this is what Sarah, John's wife, said to him. Do not worry about me or the children. I will be brave and helpful, and whatever God may send or may take away, my love for you is the strongest thing I have in life, and it will have no death. I do not worry about you. I know what you can do, and it is much. I know your strength of purpose, your sound, vigorous brain, and your sense of honor. You are well-armed, John, for any fray. And you will win, and I will win, not only success, but content and great happiness. One of the aspects of perseverance for him was the support of his wife. Absolutely. I mean, it's really quite remarkable. As they were headed to Australia in the late 1830s, it's a four- to six-month voyage. They had young kids. One was very ill and sadly died soon after they made it to Sydney. You know, she was, you know, she was not doing well. But yet, as John was, you know, on the deck of the ship, they were looking as they were headed past West Australia, south. Um, you know, they looked at the barren wasteland, and it it just looked 
forbidding. It just looked like a terrible place. I mean, what are they doing? And yet she sensed it. She came up and just gave him this such love and unconditional support that you know, having family and friends who are for us, mm. you know, no matter what, that is, that's also one of the keys to perseverance. People that believe in you, um, there aren't too many people that have achieved great things, men or women, that don't have a spouse, family, or friends that were for them. There might be one or two, but it's so much easier when you have people that believe in you, that can keep you going just that one more step. And he did in, in Sarah, a woman of great faith, and she believed in him and, and believed in, in the vision that they were going to uh, uh, craft in this new colony of, of Australia. And that's just one of the examples. You have some other examples from history um, of, of other, again, people that you have heard of and people that you haven't heard of necessarily. But, but there are people throughout history, as we, as we said at the outset, to become a quote unquote great man or woman, a woman who's left a mark on society of significance, you have had to exhibit persistence. True. Absolutely. So I think of another one, when I think of great leaders in history who had perseverance, uh, you know, I think of Winston Churchill. Um, he was somebody that, uh, you know, he made mistakes. He tended to have to um, challenge leadership, which leadership doesn't tend, tend to <laughs> like, I'm afraid. And so uh, sometimes he's on the right side of history and sometimes not. But in the early 30s, I think it was uh, Stanley Baldwin was prime minister. He challenged him maybe one too many times, and he was um, back on the back benches. In other words, he wasn't in the cabinet. He was sort of in the, uh, in the uh, kind of wastelands, so to speak, of, of politics. And the, the, the 30s are called the wilderness years for Churchill. Mm -hmm. And so during that time, in the, um, from somewhere around about 33 on, Adolf Hitler started rising to power in Germany. And um, Winston Churchill could see the danger, could see that if we don't do something, um, things are going to get so much worse. And he kept almost like a voice in the wilderness, like a Don Quixote saying, you know, you've got to watch this guy. And he said, well, there's old Winston. He was kind of old even in the 30s, you know, warmongering, running around, you know, shaking, you know, shaking his fist at windmills, just, you know, ignore him, you know, it's hard to ignore because he's eloquent and bombastic, right. but let's do our best and it'll all go away. Basically, they were saying, let's hide under the covers and maybe everything will just solve itself. Uh, but yet he never gave up. He kept um, speaking and trying to warn the nation, indeed, the world about the dangers of Adolf Hitler, but and many didn't listen. Gradually, things started turning when, um, Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia, and it's like, gosh, well, maybe Winston was right. And then he invaded Poland, and then in September 1939, World War II started. So, and eventually the miraculous happened, and um, he became prime minister. And that's where his perseverance came to the fore. Some of the greatest speeches in the English speaking language occurred during those years. Um, just after he took power in May 1940, he gave this speech to Parliament which has these famous phrases, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. He said in the same speech, victory at all costs, victory in spite of all terror, victory, however long and hard the road may be, for without victory, there was no survival. Mm -hmm. At that point, it was really, it was before the U.S. got in the war in uh, December 1941. It was, in 1940, those were dark years. It felt like, you know, Britain and the Commonwealth against, against all of the might of Germany. And then um, a few months uh, later, in 1940, uh, he gave this uh, famous speech. He said, we shall not flag or fail. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We will de shall defend our island. Whatever the cost may be, we shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the field and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. So that sense of belief that they would prevail when it didn't look so good at the time, um, this sense of perseverance. And, you know, if you bring it back to, well, how can we relate to this? Well, what was his why? 
for the sake of what? Well, mm. it was a, for the sake of the preservation of Britain as a free country and not being slaves to uh, Nazi terror and the horrors of what the Nazi regime brought to the countries in Europe that they conquered. Uh, and it was just this belief that we will find a way, and somehow they did. They found a way in the Battle of Britain uh, to hold off the mighty Luftwaffe Waffe with the RAF. It was, it was grim, but that sense of perseverance, of being completely focused on the task at hand, he never let resentment or grudges hold him back. He just threw them off. He just he didn't have time for that kind of stuff. And so he didn't. He was totally focused on his goal, which was preserving his nation. So that was, it was a very compelling vision. And Absolutely. He, he was able to inspire a nation like few others ever had. You heard Winston Churchill speaking. It's like, you know what? Winston thinks we're going to do this. We're going to find a way. We'll find a way to survive. Just one more day, one more day of freedom in this particular right. case. Now, I can imagine there are listeners right now who have just heard the story of John Fairfax, your great-great-grandfather, -grand, your, uh, great and Winston Churchill, two men who left pretty big legacies. Winston Churchill, as you pointed out, saved Britain, may have saved uh, uh, civilization in some sense as we know it. Your great-great-grandfather created this, this media dynasty that lasted five generations and created deeper legacies um, of, of, of faith and character that are now in their sixth generation with your children. And there may be people who will hear that and go, oh my goodness, I can't be a John Fairfax and I can't be a Winston Churchill. I don't know that I can do that. But that's not the point. Perseverance uh, leading to significance does not have to be that grand, does it? No, I mean, I can think of an example in, in my own life. So, um, as listeners will know from prior podcast, after my $2.25 billion takeover failed and uh, ultimately failed in late 1990, company went bankrupt. I felt responsible, certainly significantly responsible for the company falling out of family hands. It was a crushing blow. I tried to find work, but it's hard when you've got a resume that says kind of out of work media mogul. Right. I mean, you know, I tried to persuade you, look, I'm humble. I work hard. It's like, yeah, right. Forget it. Uh, so I was desperate, and um, it's just sometimes the smallest, most insignificant steps. One of the things about perseverance is you got to park your, um, you know, uh, your desire to not do things that are beneath you kind of thing. You've got to be willing to do anything, basically. And so one of the things I did is I went to some uh, temp agency that, you know, found temporary positions for, you know, accountants and financial analysts. Well, a number of years before, I'd worked on Wall Street, and I knew I could do financial analysis and say, okay, great. Well, we have this little program that will test your understanding of spreadsheets on, on Excel. And at the time, I was actually pretty good. It's like, wow, you scored. Well, you actually know how to do spreadsheets. And yeah, I guess I do. So I ended up having a temporary job at some um, you know, sports uh, company, actually with a pretty big uh, sports manufacturer. I just had an office in Maryland and I did some budgeting work and I seemed to do that okay. And the same temp agency said, well, you got good reviews from that employer. We've got another temporary position at a local aviation services company doing financial analysis. That temporary position uh, at that company in Maryland turned into a permanent position where I worked for about six years and then from there went to coaching and, and moved on. But it was it was just taking one step. Okay, it feels a bit humiliating as a Harvard MBA to go to some mm. temp agency that are looking for, you know, pay you know, minimal, per, minimal hourly wages for some financial analyst thing. And I have a Harvard MBA. You know, people in my class are, you know, working their way up to be vice president somewhere. But that was, that was just one small step on the journey. I didn't know where that was going to lead. And that's one of the other secrets of perseverance is, I didn't know that, you know, from this temp job at a sports company to an aviation services company to coaching to writing a book on my experiences, leadership, and now crucible leadership, I had no idea that it was going to end up there. How could I possibly know? But just be willing to take that next step. It seemed logical at the time, and, and don't be too proud. It's like if you feel like this is what you need to do, then do it. Now, that's, that's a really small baby step to go to a temp agency and say, do you have anything right. for me? That's not a big vision. That's like, right. you know, it wasn't really for me financial survival. It was more emotional survival. I have to do something to feel like I can contribute in some positive way using my skills. You know, I've got to be able to get out of bed and, and do something constructive. 
So that was a baby step. Just take a baby step. It doesn't have to be saving Britain or big newspaper from you know, calamity. It can be just, what's one thing I can do to help me and my family today? You know? That is an excellent place for us to drop the landing gear and begin to land the plane. I want to uh, leave folks with uh, one more quote I found, which, which uh, this one kind of surprised me. This is from Albert Einstein. And Albert Einstein said this, it's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. Um, your story makes me think of that, Warwick. Um, you know, it, it took you a little while to, to, to find your vision, to find your footing and move beyond that crucible experience. But now you are living a thriving life of significance. Um, you, uh, you stayed with your problems longer. You worked at those very things that you've encouraged uh, listeners to do. I promised um, that I was going to end us with um, persistence tips from top business magazines, some takeaway for you, listener, um, as you've heard this discussion about um, uh, uh, perseverance, what are some practical steps you could take? We've already touched on one, to remember your why. What's your vision? Um, uh, it doesn't have to be big. It just has to be focused on helping others. That's really what significance is found in helping others. So if you're stuck in a place and you feel like you can't go on and, and you need to muster perseverance, remember your why. Success Magazine suggests that one. Another one, and Warwick, you've exhibited this um, from the moment I met you. Forbes included this in their list of tips uh, for getting, um, uh, you know, having persistence in, in the wake of, of, of trials. Have a sense of humor. I mean, how important is a sense of humor when you're talking about perseverance? It is. You've got to be willing to... You know, I mean, I take life pretty seriously, but you got to be willing to laugh at yourself and your own foibles. And um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, it's funny. I do take life pretty seriously, I have to confess. But yeah, you've got to be able to have a sense of humor in the in the process, or really a sense of hope. Ab ab absolutely. I mean, as I'm sort of pondering this, it's um, it's this as Albert Einstein talked about his his work ethic. I mean. There's a lot of things in life we can't control, but we can choose to get out of bed. We can choose to keep at it, to not give up, to keep finding a way, to not, I mean, I like to think I'm as fearful as the next person. You know, I'm not, some people, I don't know, maybe some people don't have fear. Well, I have a, I'm a pretty fearful person. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a vivid imagination about what can happen and what can go wrong. I'm a strategic planner. I get that, but it's like, okay, I will not be conquered by fear. I will, you know, remember the why, remember what for the sake of what I'm doing it and, um, and have hope. That's really the key. And, and another when we think about perseverance and significance is, um, you know, be open to things, opportunities that come, that come our way. Be open to, to subtle shifts. Mm -hmm. One example that people know from the past in, about 12 years ago now, in 2008, um, the pastor of my church wanted me to give a, a message that, um, on, you know, what I'd been through and um, somehow related to David, who was a righteous person, falsely persecuted. While that wasn't me, I thought, okay, fine, I can give my story. Somehow, even though I'm not a natural public speaker, somehow that story provided hope as I was able to share what I went through and maybe some things that kind of helped me get through it. That was okay. So while I'm not necessarily a natural speaker, somehow my story connected. That's what led to me working on a book on my experiences and ultimately to crucible leadership. So when things happen in your life, pay attention and say, okay, you know, listen, mm -hmm. you know, what, this went well. Why did it go well? What does that mean? Maybe I need, maybe I need to make a subtle shift in direction. So keep moving forward and be open to the subtle shifts that will maybe ultimately take you to that, to your vision and to that life of significance. You may not see exactly where it's all headed, but you sense, you know what, I think this, this is the good next step. I'm sensing this is positive. You know, embrace hope, reject fear, and listen for those subtle shifts that will take you to a life of significance. And believe it or not, you did it again. Of the three things I was gonna talk about, you mentioned the first one before I talked about it. 
I did get in the sense of humor idea from Forrest, but what you just said summarizes perfectly what Inc. Magazine said about perseverance. And that is to recall your past persistence, to recall that the incidents in your past where perseverance has worked out, where you've put one foot in front of the other. And you just mentioned it, Warwick, you aviation services company, and that led to you know, the, the, the speech to the church, which led to the book, which led to the crucible leadership, those things become building blocks of perseverance that allow you to continue to pursue your vision toward a life of significance. Yeah. I mean, one, one baby step of success gives you a bit of motivation to go to the next step. Yeah. It doesn't yep. have to be a big win. It's just a little baby win, little step, little positive step. It's like, okay, let's keep going. So that's, Moving forward, reject fear, embrace hope, and you know what it's for the sake of what? What's the why? What's the vision? What's the life significance? Those are all keys to having uh, perseverance. That sound you heard, listener, was the captain turning on the fasten seatbelt sign. Warwick is going to get the last word because that was a great place to land the plane. Um, so we want to thank you, Warwick, and I want to thank you for joining us on Beyond the Crucible. And if you found this discussion insightful and helpful as you pursue your own life of significance, we have a favor to ask that will help us help more people like you who are seeking a way to move beyond their crucible experiences and to find the perseverance to do so. Here it is. Please subscribe to Beyond the Crucible on the app you're listening to it on right now. If you do so, it will allow you to make sure you do not miss an episode and it will make it easier for others to find us, listen to us, and share the podcast with their friends and coworkers. If you've heard something on this podcast that you'd like to learn more about, we encourage you to visit us on the web at crucibleleadership.com. One of the things that you can do there is read Warwick's blog, sign up for emails to receive Warwick's regular blogs, where he writes about the very subjects we talked about here today. You can also take a free, short assessment that will help you discover where you are on the path, on the continuum to your life of significance. What is the areas that you can work on in your life as you're, as you're moving from crucible to significance? Where are you at in that journey? And what are some resources that we can offer to help you along the way? So, until next time, please remember that, yes, crucible experiences are painful and difficult, but they're not the end of your story. In fact, they can be the beginning of a new story, a new chapter in your story that can be the most um, exciting and joyous one of your life because it's a, it's a path and a chapter that leads to a life of significance.